when I fail, when I don't achieve what I wanted, um, uh, if I don't take it as the end of the world, and then I just review and take as a lesson why I went wrong, why I failed. And if you use any failure, any setbacks as a learning experience, and actually it will evolve, it will make you a better person. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by Runners Connect. So last week, you listened in on me talking to my strength coach, Drew Watts, and he shared some of my insights, what we've been doing, and how you can reduce your risk of injuries in the future. Hopefully you enjoyed that one, even though I know it was a lot focused around my training, but I know a lot of people have requested that, so hopefully it was okay. So people tend to fall into buckets for a lot of topics, one of which is optimist or pessimist, which... Do you fall into? I know I'm definitely an optimist. But what if you were just focused on surviving, on making it through another day? I mean, we forget how easy our lives are. You know, obviously we have ups and downs, but we don't actually just have to worry about just living. But what if you were in that situation? And that's exactly what my guest today had to tell himself when he was being tortured and as he fled Ethiopia during the Civil War in 1970. Since then, he's lived his life motivating others and has tried to make a difference in the world. A difference in the world he has definitely made. You're going to hear his story, you're going to hear his insights, and just he's just such an infectiously great guy to be around. He just makes you feel good about yourself and just excited for what you can achieve. So Ted Gilletta is a world mas- world-class masters runner. He's a motivational speaker, no surprise there. A Hall of Fame athlete, he's won a Queen's Jubilee medal, he's uh, carried the Olympic torch, and he's just an all-round inspiration. So are you ready to go meet him? Let's hear a word from Jabra, and then we'll get right to it. Multiple studies have proven running with music helps to improve performance. I have become addicted to my Jabra Pulse Sport headphones, using them for almost every easy run, but shh, don't tell my coach. You will love these earbuds too, and you can enter to win a free set every month by visiting jabra.com forward slash runners connect. I'm just going to pause for a second and then we'll begin. Okay. Welcome to the Run to the po- Top podcast, Ted. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for coming on. I appreciate you fitting me in here. I mean, I, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but I can only imagine how busy you are right now. So um, this is going to be a really interesting one, I can tell. So I want to start from the very beginning. Um, and if you could kind of share your story, starting with, you know, you're initially uh, born in Ethiopia um, and, you know, you have quite an interesting background. And uh, I know this is going to be very motivational for people. So maybe if you could share your story wherever you would like to begin. Well, um, I came to Canada, Regina, Saskatchewan, 1982. I was uh, about 26 years old and um, left Ethiopia during civil war, that's in the 70s, and it's quite turmoil in Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not just um, I decided to leave my country because I was forced to leave my country, and I lived in uh, 1978 for one year in refugee camp in, in Sudan and um, left in end of 78 to Kenya and lived there for three and a half years and uh, came to Canada in 1982. So I was accepted as a refugee by Canadian government and I was randomly assigned uh, to resettle in Regina, Saskatchewan. Okay. And then you said about, you know, you you did leave or flee during the the Civil War. Um, Will you share with us what happened with um, the... You know, make, obviously not specific details there. Uh, I'm sure they're kind of upsetting for you, but you were um, involved in, you know, peaceful demonstrations and you did go through some some bad times after that. So um, could you maybe share with our listeners what, what kind of happened there and how that can, how that affected your life, the rest of your life, really, with your attitude? Well, when, when at the time, and then I was in high school, young man, and I was the first time, um, uh, generation to attend school in my village and even my mom and dad even could not read and write and 
everybody was excited and someone you know uh, completed the up to grade 12 and uh, my running is of course and suddenly i was discovered become a good runner and life was just good and mm-hmm. and i was set you know to go to university and also part of the ethiopian elite team and, and running is you know huge in ethiopia yeah. uh, uh similar to canada or us and that's equivalent to nhl hockey or a uh, basketball so um, I was excited to go at the same time, and of course, the, the civil war and uh, Ethiopia was going through rough time. At the time, Ethiopia was governed by monarchy system, so there's a resentment from the peasants um, uh, towards the uh, uh, monarchy, and that monarchy, and also, of course, the movement was uh, run by the students, by young people. I was part of that, and. Um, uh, in 1976, and in a civil protest, and, and just um, we our dissatisfaction expressing, uh, uh, you know, to oppose any change of freedom of speech and um, uh, land to tenants, uh, those kind of basically democratic right protests, and uh, randomly military start firing their weapon towards the uh, a protest, and I, I was cut short, um, and of course arrested and um, spent. Um, more than six months in the jail, and and I was likely again um, managed to escape through riot, and 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 from then, and um, of course, and I spent walking several days to get to my village where my family were, yeah. and that's 1976 and 1976, 78, part of 78, um, I was hiding, and finally, when they find out that I was hiding, and of course, the militia was um, uh, just heading to our our village. And that's the close to Sudanese border I managed to escape. And when they arrived there, and of course they burned and everything, grain, beans, and my family almost burned, torched down, mm-hmm. and they have to run away and uh, to restart their life again. So, um, and for me, I could not go back to Ethiopia and I just mm-hmm. run away. And I was a young man and uh, a unknown feature and, and became homeless and, and struggled for many years. and came to Canada and the Times Canada and they gave me a second chance and to uh, rebuild my life here, of course. And I have to work very hard and just to recover those uh, lost years and went back to school and uh, made my life here. And I have uh, two boys and beautiful wife and um, I can't complain. Life is good. Oh, well, I'm glad it has ended ended well and you've kind of, you know, turned things around. And when you did uh, initially move to Canada, was it on your own or were you with your family at the time? No, I just me. Even my family didn't know. Even in Canada at the time, we were unable to communicate uh, because of wow. the system was so, um, you know, uh, uh, it's very hard to connect um, with the family. That time communication is not used to be yeah. that years ago maybe you weren't born that's a totally different world that time and uh simplest long long distance calls was so expensive but uh, even my mom and dad they they didn't know even i was in canada and um 19 um i think the first time unable to have a connect with them about nine i was 82 i came so 1989 87 wow. first town actually they knew i was i was alive they thought i was dead so um, that's a different story. But when first I arrived in Canada, um, I was by myself in a way advantageous. Actually, I didn't have any child. And young, I was mm-hmm. young and um, able to, you know, live a uh, very simple life and to upgrade my education and, um, uh, you know, make sure and everything is right for myself before I had family. So that, that in a way is advantageous. Yes, it was uh, by myself. And... Uh, it was very tough and to immerse in, in the language and social norms and imagine Canada was very cold and, mm-hmm. <laughs> and even those simplest things was very hard to um, adapt but you know worked hard and um, took me many at least 15 years to feel even comfortable and yeah. in the same time I went my went my running running actually helped me uh, who I am today so that simple run that helped me to immerse quicker mm-hmm. and during that that time, I mean, obviously, you wouldn't have been able to run while you were kind of in hiding. And, you know, while all that was going on, I, I'm guessing that running was completely pushed out of the picture. Um, did it take you a while to, um, you know, even try it again? Or was that something that as soon as you moved to Canada, you it kind of brought you some comfort and like reminded you of something that 
brought you joy when you were at home? Uh, yes, uh, at that time, and you know, in your basic, even you know, thing, food, you know, what you have for breakfast and what for lunch. That's that's my worry. That time, I thought my running was over, and uh, sometimes just sit and dream about it. And uh, so, um, that time, absolutely, you are right. The running was just done, and I also also picked up smoking when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. talk about the other extreme. <laughs> it is uh, just to relieve the stress, and um, I came to Canada, and you know. We when we arrived, I didn't have I didn't know anyone. So um, there are few um, refugees and from Eastern Europe and escaping from the communist persecution. And also, uh, I'm sure you can recall and maybe read it. And um, Vietnam does the boat people that are arriving the same time. And mm -hmm. we have a common thing together. And every Sunday get together just for coffee and just you know talk about the conceivable negative thing happens and challenges we are facing and, uh, you know, sometimes the resistance, um, you know, to acceptance by local people, that's understandable. And 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 I would just, you know, get tired of that, actually, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that I needed some different thing. And uh, 19, around 1984, and it just have, we have a big park in Regina called Wascana Park and sit there and smoking. And I see the people running by, I just joking noon hours. Hey, you know what? And I just actually I could just take my running, and that's I'm good at it. And I remember throwing in my <laughs> pocket of cigarette. Mm -hmm. I just stopped uh, one of gentlemen running. I stopped, and I said, yeah, "I'm a member of YMCA. Why don't you come and see me?" So I went there and um, met him, and um, we start jogging together. And and and, um, and you know, I just told my. Uh, running background, and I told him the time I ran, he was just, I'm um, lying with his foot, was, you know. And so, anyway, um, I just, I wanted actually to connect with them and uh, uh, began running and joined YMCA. Um, um, we went, you know, 10K running. Uh, I remember 1984, and I didn't have much training, and I was running close to 30 minutes or faster at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just lined up all this. I knew I was a front runner, and I just kind of went up and running, and after 100 meters, I was just gasping, and mm -hmm. I ended up running 46 minutes. I remember that, and I said, oh, my God. And that was in May, and around September, I just keep running, and again, another race, and actually ended up running 37 minutes. Wow. And again, trained and, you know, end of the year, you know, by this fall and run close to 36 minutes and the following year run 33, 32 and suddenly just things, you know, within a year. And the people are just, who this guy, where is he <laughs> came from? <laughs> and uh, that person, you know, came, talked to me. Actually, I didn't believe you when you told me. So uh, after that, then met wonderful people and they helped me to immerse and just to adapt and but that actually helped me uh, more uh, to be, just to have a self-confidence. Actually, when you perform that level, uh, just my self-esteem just went high and, uh, uh, and the rest of history. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. that's very interesting and, and just amazing to see, you know, you said of how, how high of a level you were at in Ethiopia and, you know, the fact that you were able, your ego was kind of allowing you to run a 46-minute 10K and you didn't let that kind of be like, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this again. Like you allowed yourself to kind of keep chasing those improvements. And I think it's good for people to hear that. And just out of curiosity, what, what kind of times were you running? And maybe you didn't have official, but what kind of times were you running when you were, were in Ethiopia? In Ethiopia, you know, I, I was, you know, right in Ethiopia and high altitude, if you run 30 minutes, if you go to Europe, sea level, that's an equivalent to, uh, maybe to eight half and maybe in high 27s and that's what it is and i was running barely a little bit under 30 minutes wow. or close to 30 minutes i was a junior at that time so i was i was 17 18 years old i was running that um, when i thought 19 20s because of war of course uh, mm -hmm. uh, my my dreams were faded away and so uh, i never i never um i never to uh, to see more uh, that um, high level of training and I would have run well. And so um, when I came to Canada, um, you know, I started running 20, when I was about 29, about 30 years old. And so uh, by the middle of 30, I was running, you know, under 30. So mm -hmm. uh, just even, and even when I was 42, uh, in my early middle 40s, I was running half marathon about hour and five. So, wow. uh, I, you know, 
someone at the master running that time, uh, imagine when you are early 20s or uh, when you were teen, if you properly trained and uh, imagine things, you are able to run. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, we are going to go on to talk about your master's career, which, you know, has uh, brings on its whole new mm-hmm. set of um, inspiration and uh, accomplishments that you achieved. But um, when you you know, you said that running kind of brought you this peace and it was very um, comforting to you. But what is it um, about running specifically that you just really enjoy and always have enjoyed? Well, running is, uh, to me, you know, when we when you have stress, um, as, you know, solo when you run, that's why I reflect everything and think about your family and what I'm going to be doing. And um, um, even uh, during um, the process of writing my biography, and that's the time I just used to run, um, run carry with a recorded device. And, and just that's where I just clear picture of the piece when I run by myself, my long run and mm-hmm. just the mumble and just point the things came to my mind. That's the time. And it just gave me uh, freedom and just uh, to float and to run. And, and sometimes even going back when I was a little boy in Africa, <laughs> running barefoot and just reflect those kind of things. Mm-hmm. And and absolutely, and I I am sure that brings back some you know positive memories for you of like a an earlier time, but a great time for you, and that that's great. And you did mention you had your autobiography, so let's uh, before we move on, let's talk a little bit about that. Do you want to um, do you want to tell us a bit about what you know why you decided to share your story and um, you know how it how that came together? Well, I, before the biography, and because of the sport, and I get often invited to speak in the school and mm-hmm. public places, and um, mm-hmm. um, usually during my speak, I just show some of the you know things I went through, why I came to Canada, about the war, and, and some of the struggle, and being in prison, tortured, and those kind of things, and just that people more get interested. Why, and I was approached by publishing, and I said, oh, no, probably not. It, it was hard. Um, and also, uh, you know, not me, actually, about my family as well. Yeah. Well, I, I would imagine that would be the case. And especially if it was, you know, you're away from them for that, that long, that would be that would bring up lots of very traumatic things. And, you know, that's very brave of you to to share it with us. And, you know, you have become a motivational speaker, you know, um, all over the world. And um, and yeah, um, so let's talk about your master's career. You were ranked seventh in the world by Runner's World in 1997 uh, as a master. Um, but do you think that those struggles you did go through, did they give you an extra motivation to be successful? Did it give you an extra level to dig down because you know what you'd been through? Or was it always just, you know, you you always had that from the very, very beginning? I, I, always, I loved competing and in the same time. And, um, you know, uh, I just, um, when I turned and just absolutely, you know, a struggle uh, I went through, as you said, give me motivation to do. And at the same time, mm-hmm. um, still I run and, and that's within me and, and even in, if every day I run here, unless and where family uh, issue holds me back, and um, yes, and, and enjoyed, and, and, and the, you know, people met wonderful people, even mm-hmm. uh, like Rob De Castella, Steve Jones. You know, they get the British yep. to run. You know who he is? Yep. Actually, him I and I shared the room actually in Tampa uh, <laughs> when we went running, and, and even uh, people I looked up he, in that they are my age, and uh, you know, I, I used to watch them and run and. Um, you know, I would be running with them, but at the end, um, end up running against them during the master, my master career. I uh, traveled all over places and, and they brought in you know, a lot of just, I would say, unfinished business in my mind. And mm-hmm. the one, you know, I didn't get a chance uh, to perform that level in my early uh, prime years. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, you, you went on to do so much. And I love hearing that you, you traveled the world. What was your what was your favorite place you visited, just out of curiosity? You know, the most of what my favorite actually have been in New Orleans and my most of my favorite farmers in the Massachusetts, but just the coast of uh, Martha's Vineyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, they call farmers the seven, seven mile run. And I was invited. I'm doing that race this year. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Is it the first time? Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful, which is gorgeous mm-hmm. place. And I do have my friends and, and, and I stay with them. Even here, you know, we, we are thinking, even we may go visit there my, with my family. And uh, that's uh, one of my favorite places. And uh, um, uh, so, um, 
that's another one in New Orleans and, and, and a few places and I've run went and so Tampa and just you name it and just the absolutely gorgeous place in the US so um, I enjoy doing that yeah mm-hmm. every place has its own unique thing which I love so then you I I can't even begin to list all the awards you've won you know Hall of Fame Queen, Queen's Jubilee you've won all kinds of awards but one that really caught my eye well I don't know if it's so much an award but you did carry the Olympic torch so um, could you maybe share with us uh, about that moment and what it meant to you? Uh, the, yes, the uh, Olympic torches, actually, I felt like I, I was, um, you know, the one opportunity I missed to be, I would have gone, I, I was confident I would have gone 1980 Olympics if I have a chance. Mm-hmm. And for me, um, uh, that's uh, when I was actually carrying torch and, and, and that, that's, uh, if, uh, you know, that to relieve that, you know, a missed opportunity, and then I was so uh, delighted and I felt like and have an opportunity actually to, I felt like actually I've been a member of the team. So uh, it, it gave me that's a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, opportunity uh, just to reflect back. Yeah, yeah. No, that's something that I think we we all would love to have the opportunity to do at some point. And can you share with us, you know, you did say it was a missed opportunity. What was it that happened that uh, prevented you from running in that 1980 Olympics? Oh, 1980, and, and I was a part of the groom to be, you know, high high caliber um, Olympian. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when war broke, out, I, I was away. I was. Oh, that was, was during. The, okay, yeah, that was of course yeah. during that time. And then by the time you kind of got going again, it was it was a little bit too late for like to run. Yeah, uh, to run, and I was okay. refugee camp, and all my twenties was I was I was I was looking place to reestablish. I was in Canada, uh, still the, those few years as quite big struggle for to adjust for me. So I didn't get a chance even to train. Mm-hmm. And and what is it about being in Canada that you, you love the most now, now that you've been there for many, many years? I'm in Canada, I, I just, you know, I was so grateful and that they gave me a second chance to, to you know, to establish myself, uh, to have a home. And I was stateless and, 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 and you know, to have an opportunity to, to give a shot um, mm-hmm. at life and at, at general, not only. Um, you know, awards and honorary doctor of law degree and, yeah. and you know, uh, all those things. But um, as be productive member and very active and well respected in the community and in the position, even, you know, to empower and to give back to community, even the last 20 years, mm-hmm. I do have a sort of foundation. I raised uh, close to 700,000 for local wow. kids, uh, including uh, building a school in Africa. That's amazing. Oh, what, what what a way to give back. And and did you kind of know once you, was it as soon as you moved to Canada or as soon as you kind of fled Ethiopia that you wanted to do your part to make a difference in the world? I mean, we're going to go on in a minute to some of the things you've done uh, recently with that. But did you kind of always feel like you wanted to be a leader and someone who made a difference? Well, it, it, that kind of leadership, actually, I, I credit my mother. She's the one in the still at my early age, and she was a community leader in the mm-hmm. village. Oh. So uh, that, and um, and also being a student council leader when I was in high school, and I do have that desire. Um, but to, in Canada, I never thought even, you know, do this thing or run for office or to be asked and uh, to even just a while ago, I was I received a call if I want to run for mayor, actually a mayor civic election coming yeah. up. But I said, um, I can't just it's not the right time for him. But things just evolve itself. For me, uh, when I do, just I don't brag. Just one thing that happens. I always I found for new things. Just things happens when that happens. That opportunity, and I tend to capitalize and just keep doing and and. Uh, so that's who I am, and always I like to be part of the community activities, and um, always focus on the positive things. And if I have to uh, just complain, I do have a ton of ton of um, uh, negative things um, um, have happened. I would be consumed, and then always just feel sorry for myself, mm-hmm. and I avoid all those negative things and just focus on the positives. So how do you how do you do that for someone maybe who is listening right now and they tend to, you know, um, I mean, listening to a story like yours is always going to hopefully change the way people think. But if if someone listening is really struggling with staying positive right now, what what would you like to tell them? Well, well in a way, um, you know, always um, the life as whole and it's not a smooth. It just has to be a bump. And some of those bump when you to me 
when I fail, when I don't achieve what I wanted, um, uh, if I don't take it as the end of the world, and then I just review and take as a lesson why I went wrong, why I failed. And if you use any failure, any setbacks as a learning experience, and actually it will evolve, it will make you a better person. Um, it's, it's not, you know, uh, if everything is so smooth, me anyway, personally, in my opinion, some people may think this is weird, but um, it's actually make you a better person. Mm -hmm. And, and, and even we have a setback, and even if you lack some sort of being compassion to others, and it'll make you think about that why, and I should that with even health issues and financial setbacks and bankruptcy and all all those things. And to me, if it just why that happened, and you have to be responsible whatever happens to you. Everybody uh, have choices to make, and then also. Uh, you have a right choices also to make a decision to make that change. And for me, I just take as a lesson and learn about that and just carry on um, um, and so just focus why the good things happen to you. So would you say you do you do, do a lot of analysis then when, when something does go wrong, you kind of look at all the things that could have caused that? Or is it you just kind of let it roll off your back and say, okay, you know, this is going wrong, but this is good? That's a depending the situation, mm -hmm. depending the situation. And, um, um, uh, um, you know, it's some just really go and some just have to analyze and what went wrong. And this another does the past election and we lost by, you know, by 144, very close rules. That one we have to analyze and what went wrong. And, and again, to avoid such a close, you know, loss for next election. And, um, and we, we, with those kind of bigger scales, as I analyze, but the short ones, not really, no, mm -hmm. don't just let it go. And that's what it is and move on. <laughs> and just to clarify for people who, who, you know, you and I have talked a bit before, but, um, so you were recently nominated for the pro legislative assembly of Saskatchewan. Uh, but w what did that involve for people who may not know what that means? It is it's the the parliamentary system, the provincial legislative assembly. That's where the lawmakers and, and, and the legislators. That's why we 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 you know we make a decision, the budgets and um, um and uh, this governing body of like you know mm -hmm. uh, Canada have a ten provinces, and so those ten provinces combine the federal. So uh, so we have a sixty one. Um, MLS, that's a member of the Legislative Assembly, we have a we run, we do have to compete for that seat. So I, I, I run for one of the city uh, seats. So that's uh, where the election was last April. Mm -hmm. And what kind of things did you did you learn during that experience? I mean, I'm guessing that um, you, you learned a lot about the world of politics and just kind of how um, you know, how you could make a difference in the world. But did you see any um, parallels with running or was there anything that kind of stood out to you about um, about this process? It, it is similar in a way, the same, but running is we don't have much emotional stress. But this, yes, of course it does. And I learned a lot listening to people, issues, matters for them. And, um, um, you know, for all walks of life and the issues for, you know, amazing things about politics and, what the issue matters for you, but somebody's issues may not be matter for you, especially young mothers and uh, in income inequality, people live in poverty and, and the seniors, the healthcare, uh, education, and just listening, that was so incredible, incredible history um, uh, and experience, positive experience I have. And, um, you know, just to voice for them, uh, uh, dealing with such a complex issue, and uh, mm -hmm. the, similarly, the fitness actually came came you know come when we were knocking doors. Sometimes for seven, eight mm -hmm. hours a day, we knock doors. So uh, I remember even the people younger than me, and after two, three hours, they could not do it. And then I just walk in nine hours, and I get high, and uh, just take a break and just keep going. And so yes, it does help mental toughness, uh, discipline to listen for others what they have to say rather than telling them what's good for them that was that was just an mm. extraordinary experience politics never been new to me but um uh, it you know it's a democratic process the same in britain and here uh you know it's not like uh, if you just protest or if you criticize the government you go to jail mm -hmm. uh, it you know you can we have a freedom of speech and we can't write i can blog and um, I can say I can give a statement that in Ethiopia and then for 
there. And uh, um, remember after my nomination night and I was speaking my brother home and he was so worried and Javi, you know, what the hell are you doing? And because of politics and you left Ethiopia and now your adopted country, I hope they don't kick you out. And I said, and I said, you know, Gadamo, his name is Gadamo. I said, no, in, in, in Canada, it's not like that. And you <laughs> do carry on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. And so you have maintained a good relationship with your family. Like, do you talk to them often? Yes, often and nowadays in Skype or usually in phone calls, Facebook and a FaceTime and just things have changed in the last 30 years and mm -hmm. since I came to Canada. Yeah, the world of technology. And I'd love to hear kind of a little insight. Um, when was the last time you went uh, back to visit or do you go back often? Uh, in Ethiopia, uh, in, prior to 1991, I could not go because... Yep. You know, the government changed in 1991 when Ethiopia as a part of the Eastern Bloc um, with the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the regime also collapsed and changed. And um, after 24 years absence, I went back um, um, 1999 and I, I met my family and, uh, uh, you know, always uh, probably I don't know about you, but me. Um, when I left Ethiopia, um, you know, suddenly you just wake up and uh, you, you, you left um, um, uh, and uh, ran away from my life. And um, uh, even though I came to Canada, I established um, all my, my, my life um, here. And I felt like um, still I struggled with that home. I call it home, and in, in, in the terms of residence, I do have a home, but uh, it still lacked that peace. Yeah. And uh, when 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 I went back, uh, just I thought, uh, you know, would change, but when it's going to be the same, and it wasn't. And things have changed just since I left, and uh, my peers I grew up, and they moved on, they passed on, and uh, this generation that's that's long time, and um, uh, just when came back it gave me some 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 sense of closure it is actually it helped me so often after that i went a few times and uh, now i know uh, uh regina saskatchewan canada as my home okay well that's great and i i don't think i've quite let go yet either i still say home is back in england and um yeah that's uh i do say home here as well but it, it like you said in my heart it's uh england is always going to be my true home yeah, it's, it is. You know, I remember, you know, when if until 99, you go to at the tourist, I go to Mexico somewhere in Europe and I've been there. And, uh, you know, if you, for you, uh, if you go there, that tourism or all you go to visit and, and as a temporary, you have a home, you have to go back. Mm -hmm. But even I felt um, uh, when until 99, I felt Canada, I just always in my mind, I was a temporary here. Yes. Uh, it's not home. And I'm going to go somewhere, but I never knew what that or where where home was. And and good thing is that now going back and just brought the closure. Mm -hmm. And I bet that was a good moment for you, kind of realizing like you finally found that place where you felt like you belong, and you you know realized that uh, Canada does want you. And I definitely can mm. empathize with that. I I felt the same way with the U.S. Like um, you know people were just waiting for. Uh, a reason to kick me out so yeah, <laughs> yeah i definitely i definitely can feel you but it must have been a special moment for you when you realized that you you do have a home there yeah it is it's, it's a broader i know i have my kids and wife here and um and this is home so uh, um uh it now just brought some sort of uh, peace mm -hmm. have you taken some of your um little cultural things maybe like meals that you had or maybe some little things that you've kind of uh, taken along with you and shown your kids and your wife? Yeah, we do. Actually, there's an Ethiopian restaurant here locally mm -hmm. and we go actually, they love that spicy food and um, and still we connect, have a paintings and some of the you know stuff I brought from home. So uh, we plan to go back again in a few, two years and uh, have a five years old and, and have also uh, older son in his 20s. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then um, when you do go back, I'm guessing you do see or maybe even join in with um, some of the running that goes on there. Um, have you seen a difference in the way that Ethiopia kind of um, approaches running since, you know, obviously during the Civil War time, there was it would <laughs> have been very different. But um, in recent years, have you seen more of a focus on uh, running or is it still kind of the same as it was? 
Well, no, things have changed. It's extremely have evolved at some uh, just incredible. I, I guess the way of they see it now is a business. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the way of uh, and also running have changed so much, so much uh, uh, people's life. And, and uh, uh, if you look at it, even now, we don't see a lot of people shifting from track and just road race and marathon. That's the money is in 20, 25 years. Is when someone unknown never run, competed them. Um, Back and just you know, probably you know, two or six, two or seven, and mm-hmm. and, and uh, that made a huge change. And for me, even one of the equation earlier, uh, maybe you may come and, and uh, uh, who you know influenced you was a bikila, a baby bikila, a barefoot runner, and he came and spoke in school when I was some um, grade eight, grade nine, and um, uh, he was you know hero. Uh, he was actually worshipped more than king at that time. Mm-hmm. Ethiopia used to be a monarchy system, and um, uh, he ran a barefoot 1960 and 64, also winning back-to-back Olympic medal. Uh, he his message inspired me, and uh, he you know, he spoke and, uh, genuinely how poor he was and how running changed his mind. And um, uh, if you believe in yourself, no anybody will stop you. And um, uh, just don't take any conceivable reason uh, to hold you back. And I don't have any shoes and. Uh, you can run. Running is one of the simplest form of exercise. Actually, you don't need a lot of gears. And uh, I remember talking that, and that just still remains with me. And uh, don't set barriers. Rather than setting barriers, just set a goal. No shortcuts, and um, be consistent. And um, there's no. It's not going. Success not going to happen within a short time. To be patient and uh, listening to him and sitting on the floor and when he was speaking that and that just struck me still in my mind i just you know vividly still i can't remember those conversation he's the one actually his message is one changed my life mm-hmm. did you ever get the chance to tell him that well uh, no he died um and after that he got a car accident i think oh, 1974 no. and that was about 1970 of uh, that opportunity to have an attorney after that he has uh, paralyzed and and again when i saw him and um Actually, he, uh, you know, I thought he's a huge, you know, figure, but he's a just like an ordinary man and, mm-hmm. and, and uh, like a little guy and, and a wheelchair confined. And also that told me as a part of us being human, how vulnerable we are. And, you know, that's all things can go overnight. Just, you know, so uh, he was restricted um, and the wheelchair and then out in a couple of years, I think he died. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's sad. But, um, you know, I'm glad his message was able to stay with you for life. And and you mentioned about vulnerability, which is something that I I talk about often and I kind of very passionate about because I feel like that's not necessarily a weakness in people no. to show you vulnerability. Um, and, you know, I've seen a few things where you kind of think that same thing. So why is it you think we're so afraid to show the vulnerability? And then why do you not not uh, hide from it? Well, I guess that's depending on the individuals, and that's I believe that's we are humans, and and you know even though culturally in the boys now not supposed to cry, you don't have as I seen as a weakness more the cultural and um, uh, to me, uh, you know that's who we are, and if you don't show those weaknesses, if you don't shed the tears, and for when you get sad and when you get happy. Uh, that's all who we are, even though we try to <laughs> deny and mm-hmm. pre- you know, pretend we are no machoism, but we 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 possess all those um, uh, qualities and and, and um, uh, personality. And uh, to be uh, me, and even yesterday, actually, I spoke um, um, such a thing in one of the inner schools, and they asked me, uh, in how we, why you feel comfortable actually sharing so deep personal things? And I said, well, that's what it is, and that's it. It was, and and um, uh, for me, I hope someone learns from that and just you know keep a message and um, uh, not to miss out. And, and you know, education is very important for me. And my mom taught me. And secondly, and when I was younger and you know, barefoot and school was you know picked on and bullied and um, as a being uncivilized and you know, pagan and those kind of names it was called and. Uh, so uh, that did not pretend and uh, prepare um, hold me back actually what I want to achieve. So I just sharing those things absolutely are right. Some people 
too personal, but already book was out there and I don't have it just put it everything, of course, and except few detailed and uh, some of the, my uh, family, you know, especially during the war, exactly some of the detail I did not share, but the most of my life story is on the shelf there. Mm-hmm. Yep, and you did, and you did put those out, uh, like we mentioned earlier, in your autobiography, um, and that is available for purchase. Um, or... Well, it's available. I think now we're out of print, and um, oh. I, I just we have a few copies, and um, um, we, now the things have changed since that book was in two thousand six, and and also actually my life have evolved even for better. Mm-hmm. So we may have to add some of those yeah. things that soon and. Maybe we'll touch if you would like the copy of the Tumail one. Yeah, no, I know. We'll put a link to it in the show notes for people to purchase if, if they can get a hold of it. Um, and that will be at runnersconnect.net forward slash 109. Um, and then so, you know, you, you've mentioned all these things you've you've achieved. And, um, you know, you, you did your honorary uh, Doctor of Law degree in 2014. You know, we've talked about what you've been doing in politics that you're even, you know, approached about being mayor. And I mean, I can't even imagine how much more you can add, but uh, what do you see as your future kind of um, coming to you as of right now? Well, well I guess the future right now, um, I'm homestay that, you know, I, it's when you are 61 years, a lot of people, their retirement, most having a five years old son at home. So uh, my wife is, you know, quite a little bit younger than me. She, you know, her career is going very well, and we talked about it. And rather than she stay home, I, I chose to stay home. That's and wonderful. at the same time, I do workshops and I do speaking and coaching. I do have a, my club, um, and it just expand those things for me. And all these things evolve. Even it just come the knocks, opportunity knocks on my door. And when it happens, even I don't plan. And uh, there are so many things. Uh, still need to be done and i'm quite um uh involved in the community and eradication of poverty and and, and that's that's the one i always i could not stand and um how the poverty actually denies the opportunity for the people mm-hmm. uh, you know first nations in canada probably you have read and some of them struggling newcomers and um i do help them mentor them even uh this is some people i coached and they managed to uh, secure the scholarship and um, uh, track scholarship and uh, and achieve the great career and so I'm going to keep doing those things and for me it's not really retirement it's not an, an issue as far as my mind is working and physically still able to do I just keep doing those things um, um, you know until I could not do them otherwise there's no any time limits. Mm-hmm. I love that you um, that you know don't have these specific. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. You kind of allow um, life to unfold as it should, and and I've kind of been working on that a lot recently. And it it is a a, a better way to live because um, you know you just let opportunities happen and uh, you know approach them as as they mm-hmm. unfold. And um, you know I've always believed that good things happen to good people, and you know you are the perfect example of that. So it's it's great to see and. Um, and then are you still running yourself? Yes, I run. And even this morning, you know, we, we uh, do have a, a close to 45 runners. And we, right. we go 5, 5.30 in the morning. Some of the family from all walks of life and uh, and just coach them. And this morning, then again, evening, I have. And uh, so some people run the track. But I used to coach uh, university college kids. But now this is more road runners. Okay. A more kind of fitness uh, people just do for fitness even they don't compete and even some walkers actually in my group so mm-hmm. all walks of life so and uh, some people they have a quite high caliber runner still run about 32 35 36 10k Great. and uh, some people like to qualify for boston every year and we send uh, a few people towards boston and new york so they need to qualify for that distance mm-hmm. and uh, i just help them guide them and enjoy you know, their success and it's actually rewarding when someone, uh, you know, achieves their goal. And that's, that's so actually I love to do. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I could definitely see that. And and for someone listening who just happen, doesn't happen to know about this group, where could they find more information about it? We, we do we do have a geladapacers.com if okay. you are able to visit. I think I have yeah. a two website and uh, tabgelada.com yeah. and geladapacers.com. Okay, I will put links to those in the show notes as well. Okay, we're just going to pause for a minute just to hear from our sponsor and then we will be back with the final kick round. Okay. 
Depending on where you are in the world, summer or winter is coming. We only have a few precious weeks of this ideal running weather before the mental battles begin. Music or podcasts can make those long training days much easier, and I love to listen to 90s music to get me through the really tough parts. Jabra Pulse is the wireless sports earbud that was designed with runners in mind. Yes, that means no slipping out of your ear on those hot summer days, especially with the customizable in-ear pieces. It even has an accurate in-ear heart rate monitor, so you can use that to make sure those easy days stay easy. Yeah, just like you promised. I love mine, and I've run with musical podcasts more in these past few months than I have in the rest of my life combined. That is how great these are. Runners Connect listeners can get exclusive offers and enter to win a free Jabra Pulse headset by signing up at jabra.com forward slash runners connect. That's J-A-B-R-A dot com forward slash runners connect to start your journey or buy the Jabra Pulse at your local Best Buy. Jabra, this is where it starts. Okay, and we're back. So I just have the final kick questions for you. This is going to be a really interesting one. But uh, what is the greatest greatest advice you've ever received? Or is it what we heard earlier? Well, I guess the greatest advice I received of uh, a barefoot marathon runner, Abebe Bekela, when he came and spoke to a school. Um, I was the one of the fortunate enough uh, to attend um, the, his speaking uh, uh, event and uh, uh, you know, we first, you know, we hear about him like a hero and that mm-hmm. he's just too highly regarded internationally. So I was so eager uh, to hear what he has to say. He was a very simple man and uh, um, easily approachable. And, um, uh, you know, his message was uh, no shortcuts. And if you set your mind and uh, if you do the work, anything's possible. He was right. And um, uh, no shortcuts again again he repeated that and you have to be patient mm-hmm. um, things will happen and and even if you encounter the setbacks and take as a learning rather than at the end of dreams and i remember he was sharing and uh, and also his own upside down and um, and also meeting him uh, after he was paralyzed and how all those things have just changed like a movie and just great and again sad and um, and the, you know, suddenly he's gone. So his advice is still, and as an adult, I still just, you know, I, I do have his quotes actually in my office. So oh. always his great quotes and his pictures on my wall. That's great that you can see that every day. And, you yeah. know, that's that's just wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, your favorite running book or blog? You know, particularly, I just don't have any favorite, but uh, I, re- I read all the science journals and in new ideas and even runners world and British runners world, um, US runners, I was every, every running magazine, but they, they often, the blog, I go read it, um, I, um, IAAF, that the international mm-hmm. amateur does website and or quite at least daily uh, about international runners who's hot and he's, you know, the young upcoming and, um, and I go frequently visit that website. Could you see yourself doing something in the future with IAAF? I, I don't know if, you know, it's possible and everything, you know, comes mm-hmm. and even I, I like to be part of that. And I was so excited. And yeah. I remember even going meeting in Ethiopia, those run. Usually when I go back, I just run with them. And so uh, even when I was competing in my master's circuits and uh, some of those Kenyan African runners and um, sometimes the, the, the people take advantage of them because of the language barrier and mm-hmm. you know, quite understand them. Uh, some of them end up losing their prize money, I remember, uh, when I was competing. So um, even in that capacity, just to advise them, to help them, no anybody takes advantage of those people. So. That's great that you give them the, that advice, and I'm sure that, I that well, makes I have it always on and off actually get the email from them, advise them, make sure before you sign, you understand what you're signing. Mm-hmm. That that's so important, and you know we need more people like you in this world because that's a uh, that's obviously an issue that's going on within the world of running. So it's great. Oh, yeah, absolutely, I'm sure you may have heard that the behind mm-hmm. the scenes we don't hear, and uh, some of the they winning a lot of pride, but that they don't see penny that, then maybe they take a small portion of it. That's the yeah, it's just wrong. We need to make some changes here. Yeah, th- this absolutely, is uh, yeah. <laughs> we can work on this together. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, what would you like to tell a new runner? It especially comes to real run, even as a myself, as a coach, my number one advice um, when you take up the sport or running, um, 
to join a running club mm -hmm. or someone uh, have uh, some sort of running experience rather than just, you know, read. There's uh, so many information out there, um, system and in that can cause setback or injury. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have someone to guide you, um, join a club, uh, be patient and you no know, shortcuts. And um, even some people just, I'm going to start running marathon right away, planning career that distance 42 kilometers. I would suggest advise them for maybe two, three years, run 5Ks, mm -hmm. 10Ks, mm -hmm. half marathon gradually and get used to your body. And and, and, and so we, you, know, you want to keep running as a lifestyle rather than just um, run one and have a bad experience, quit. So uh, I I prefer uh, beginners just to join the club or with someone coaching advice. Absolutely. And, you know, we're, we're huge fans of that at Runners Connect. I mean, we have our coaching, um, but, you know, it is so important um, having that outside opinion to, like you said, prevent injuries and make sure, like you said, it becomes a lifelong thing rather than something you get excited about at the start and then burn out. So thank you. Cool. That's I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, yeah. What is or was your pre-race meal? Well, another, that's another one. Pre -race, to me, pre-race pre meal, um, I guess in a way, myth, I don't know what to say. And we, so we just go do the carbo loading. For me, uh, the day before what you ate, it's not going to make that huge. It's not, it will not create a miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to me, uh, just eat right. Just eat to train. Uh, fuel your body as an athlete. When 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 overall, your diet actually one plays very important role for you. So, usually day before race, what I do, uh, you know, I have done what works for me. Uh, have a you know, bigger breakfast and bigger lunch, but have a lighter. A meal and supper and, and has to be I don't put a lot of um, meat or I don't consume even usually plain pasta or rice usually mm -hmm. I eat so in Ethiopia we grew up with a simple carbohydrate in Africa that that's why usually we eat very simple it does not upset your tummy when you are competing mm -hmm. and make sure there's enough time to digest and you know to clear your system uh, able to perform if you tummy get upset and if you eat a known meal, you are not helping yourself. So yeah. maybe may not able to finish your race. So um, as a you know, trial and error, whatever works for the individuals. But my suggestion is not to eat a um, heavy meal overnight. Mm -hmm. And maybe you know five o'clock, four thirty. You should probably make sure you have enough time uh, to digest and early in the morning and to clear up your system. And do you have something in the morning as well, or is that? Usually for me, depending what I'm running, it's a 10K, 5K, uh, maybe two hours before I have a piece of dry toast and okay. a cup of coffee and uh, water. That's what usually I do. Um, uh, if I eat too much, just I could not perform. Mm -hmm. uh, usually mm -hmm. I avoid uh, eating a morning. And uh, marathon, and, and um, the same situation, and even it's not. And I don't eat much. Um, I make sure I have a little bit in my tummy and you know, coffee, of course, I had, I don't know what mm -hmm. it is, and, uh, uh, and the dry post, usually, that's what usually I, I eat um, before marathon. Uh, and and, and there's, there's no need, if you train, if you are fit, actually, you don't need that, mm -hmm. but uh, depending your fitness level, actually, as if, you know, even when I just notice even myself, when a little bit out of shape, I tend to actually drink water, but when I'm actually in my highest level of fitness, even for half marathon, I don't drink water. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I never, I mean, I guess, I guess half marathon I might drink once, but yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess when you are in your peak uh, shape, you know, you're, or would have been, you would have been running around an hour. So, you know, that's around that borderline that's of where you can get away right. with it. So I that makes sense. I've been for a long time. You are right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Yeah. And finally, um, a favorite running product. Well, that's another one. And, uh, <laughs> It's not really, um, things have changed the last, you know, yes. you know 34 years in, in, in my, my running career. Uh, my, I just, growing up in Ethiopia, I was running a barefoot. That's another one, a sport itself. You don't need a lot of gadget. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, uh, my favorite running product is um, running flat, racing flat, and that has to be very light and soft. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, shoes. I, see, I use it as a 
uh, to protect me from the harmful object when I'm hitting the ground. Mm-hmm. And um, I had a trouble even when I have those stability shoes, heavier shoes, I tend to have an issue. Um, even on the grass, still not, still I run barefoot, actually, when I have a you know, golf course and uh, uh, I found. And, and in Canada and also, um, you know, weathers could be very extremely harsh winter time. Yeah. Uh, some of the uh, winter running gears, they are one more. Um, I have to because if I'm from Africa. I still <laughs> live for almost 35 years. I still struggle with the cold weather. Uh, some of the technology like tights and uh, windbreaker and those those ones um, are my favorite products winter time. In terms of watch garment, I don't. Yeah, I didn't I, expect that. <laughs> that one, I, I run, but how I feel. That's, That's how you what, should. Yeah, the same thing for me. Even a lot of they spend a lot of expensive gadgets and uh, you know those uh, heart, heart heart rate monitors and even my wife owns <laughs> those garments. She about five hundred. Are you going to spend? Okay, you can, but not me. But uh, even uh, I don't use that. Just I use the uh, simple Timex watch. Mm-hmm. Oh, you don't have to convince me. I'm all about intuition as well. I do have a Garmin. I do use my Garmin, but I, uh, I'm i definitely all about intuition when it comes to running. So I'm with you right there. Yeah. Well, Ted, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I'm sure our listeners are going to have learned so much and just a whole change of perspective. So I really appreciate your time. Okay, thanks, Tina. And uh, keep in touch. Thanks. Well, I told you he was inspirational. <laughs> you can see why he's been so successful in everything he's put his mind to. He's just one of those people you can just sit down and listen to for hours. I just wanted to take in every single nugget of wisdom he could give me. So I just want to say congratulations to Christina Dujic for winning the Jabra headphones for this month. So make sure you enter to win next month at jabra.com forward slash runners connect. Next week, I'm going to be bringing back Born to Run author Chris McDougall, and you're going to hear what he's been up to and what book he's working on next. (laughs) And I just want to give you a hint, it involves a donkey. Yep, you're going to have to tune in to make sure you find out. Make sure you click subscribe on your iPhone, iPad, on Android or podcast player to get the episodes delivered directly to you every Wednesday. So until then, have a great week.